Hi, and welcome to Genius Tea Time with Sox Whitmore. Thank you so much for being part of this. This is awesome. So I'm introducing Sox in their own words. Sox Whitmore is an agender, gender non-conforming performer, composer, and storyteller rooted in voice and text. You can hear their voice and musical talents in audio dramas, in video games, audio books, and on the cast albums of musicals, including their own original works. We are here in Back to One, a coming of self musical. On fancier occasions, they've performed in renowned places like the Grand Old Opry, the Carnegie Hall, and the Sydney Opera House. Dang. Uh, their creative work has been produced by New Musicals, Inc. and Overtone Industries and published by American Composers Forum, the Sappho Small Talk blog, Translash Media, and Queer Quarterly Magazine, among others. A self-described professional overachiever, Sox likes to keep busy. If they're not recording VO or writing a new musical, they can be found working on choral music, indie games, short fi fiction, or amassing large amounts of socks. Hence the name, I'm guessing. Okay. All right. And for those who are curious, they hold a BFA in performer and composing from CalArts. Welcome. Thank you. And do you want to tell us about the Trans Entertainment Guild, which is the group that we're sponsoring today? I sure do. And thank you for reading my bio so enthusiastically. You got me excited to hear me. So <laughs> thank you. The Trans Entertainment Guild is an organization I'm really excited to support. Um, there are colleagues of mine at the helm, Mika and Natalie, who have been doing the work to increase transgender accessibility, representation, safety, doing the advocacy work in artistic spaces, particularly theater. Um, one of their most recent projects was doing an all transgender cast production of The Civility of Albert Cashier. And they did that in New York, which was incredible. They are doing an amazing advocacy work for trans artists in theater. So I'm really excited for this talk to be doing a little something for them. That is so cool. All right. And please tell us about trans inclusion and in artistic spaces. Diving right on in. So just to give us a little bit of trans 101 kind of at the top and make sure we're all on the same page, let's let's get some terms straight, right? So the word trans or transgender in full, often used interchangeably, mean someone who does not identify with the gender they were assigned at birth. Um, and then cisgender as the corresponding term is someone who does resonate with the gender they were assigned at birth. So those two terms we use to describe the types of people in the world. You'll also hear non-binary. That is an umbrella term that describes individuals who don't resonate with the gender assigned at birth, but don't necessarily resonate entirely with one binary gender, male or female. Um, and then if this may be a little new information, uh, identity, expression, and pronouns kind of the big three tiers of how we talk about gender are all different separate things. So someone's gender identity may not align as what we expect with their gender expression, the way that they dress, have their hair, use makeup or accessories, um, and the pronouns that they use. For instance, I use they, them pronouns as in here and here and on a mask that I was wearing out and about earlier today. So pronouns are the language tool we use to address gender. And you might find that the pronouns you expect someone to use are not the pronouns that they actually are utilizing. So it's really important not to make assumptions and to come into a lot of spaces with the mindset of, I can't know what anyone is without them telling me. So starting to create that opportunity for people to self-describe and define and making spaces where everyone is invited to be the definer of the language used to describe them. I thought I'd kind of guide us a little bit through my own journey and start right around when I discovered and came out uh, as gender non-binary. So I, like many people, grew up without a lot of knowledge about transgender topics and queer topics. I grew up on the East Coast in a tiny little town in Western Maryland where we did not have trans people. Uh, and I didn't know anything about this community before age 18. And when I moved out to California for the first time for college and started to actually meet trans humans, my peers, and talk with them, it introduced me to information for the first time that gave me context for the feelings I'd had for a long time. 
So talking about transness is so important because you don't know what someone doesn't know that might be, that might change their life to know. For me, meeting my first gender fluid friends in my first year of college was a really defining experience that encouraged me over the following months to really question my gender identity. And I came out about a year after moving out to California in the summer of 2018. From there, I was a college student starting to use they, them pronouns. I was going by the name Socks at that time and figuring out how to be a non-binary person in an artistic space. And one of the first projects that I actually worked on as a non-binary person out and proud was an original musical of mine called We Are Here, noted in my bio, where I had already cast myself before coming out. I had already planned to play the lead role of a cisgender lesbian character. And so you know, I'm entering this situation now playing a role that I don't resonate with as much because the pronouns are different. And so this started me really questioning how I wanted to be referred to in the rehearsal space, how I wanted my colleagues to separate my character and her gender identity versus me and mine and making sure that those two things didn't get mixed up in a way that made me feel uncomfortable. You might notice if you've been in a lot of rehearsal rooms where characters are a part of the rehearsal process that directors use the names interchangeably of actor and character a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. And usually that's not a big deal, but if you're a trans person playing a gender that does not resonate with who you are, sometimes that can be really uncomfortable to be referred to as your character more than is necessary. So in that space, I talked with my cast about it and made it clear that, you know, we wanted everyone's pronouns to be shared and respected and that I was interested in having my character referred to with her pronouns as long as everyone else's characters and their pronouns were also being utilized in the same way. I wanted to make sure that character conversations belonged in one space and conversations directed at the actors belonged in a separate space. So that was one big thing that I discovered early on. Something else that I also had to learn to deal with is um, before I transitioned physically, so there's a lot of ways that physical and social transition look like for a trans person moving from one form of gender expression to another. And before I had my gender affirming surgery, I was wearing a, an article of clothing called a chest binder. And so this article of clothing compressed my chest so that I would have a flat appearance that I didn't naturally have. But as a singer, that also sometimes was putting pressure on my lungs and creating an added barrier for me to fully access my air and do my craft. So a lot of people might not actually realize that the trans humans in their life are wearing garments or other accessories that are gender affirming, but can sometimes cause limitations or need some type of care and management to be done safely. A binder should actually never be worn for more than eight hours at a time. And we know that in this industry, sometimes we're at a gig for more than eight hours at a time. Sometimes we're on set for 12 hours at a time. And I was on a music video project once where I was the only one who said, hey, for those of us who are wearing chest binders, where there'll be, will there be a built-in break and an area where I can change and take a rest? Because I needed a private area where I felt safe not wearing my gender affirming garment. And I also needed a good period of time, like 20 minutes or so to really rest and allow my body to safely continue wearing that garment while doing my craft. So something you might think about while you're working with trans individuals who are, who are utilizing some of these tools for gender expression is to ask them, hey, are you using anything um, to affirm yourself that might require an extra break, a separate changing space? Are there any things that you need to feel really safe and comfortable and able to express yourself in that way without harm? A lot of times just asking the question can be really valuable. Um, you'd be surprised how many people don't think to even just ask? You know, if you do nothing else, if you take nothing else away from this talk and you can't remember any of the information, just remember to ask the question because it's not bad to ask. We know as trans people that this education is not being provided. The work that I'm doing right now was not given to you in a school. You had to come here to get me to talk to you about this. And so we understand that the education hasn't been given freely and that a lot of people are dealing with ignorance that they didn't opt into. So if you just show 
your interest in learning more by asking the question, you've already demonstrated a really important part of allyship, which is that you want us to feel safe, even if you don't necessarily know the first thing to do. And so I know of me, not every trans person can be spoken for by me. I'm only one human, but I know for me that I love just knowing that you've said, hey, what can I do to make you feel comfortable? Then I know you're an ally and that I can really come to you with things that I might need. Other situations, I don't feel safe because maybe I noticed that nobody else in the room used their pronouns when they introduced themselves. Or I can tell very clearly that I'm the only person in the room who is gender nonconforming in any way. And I feel very isolated in those circumstances sometimes. That happens with a lot of marginalized groups, you know, we we tend to notice when we're the only person in the room and the best way to make a space feel accessible when when a minority has been minorized is to make it clear that you want the base standard for any space to be accessibility. Laura and I were talking about uh, how accessibility for disabilities also kind of bleeds into this realm. There's a lot of overlap in the disabled yeah. and trans community. And a lot of this work is the same work of making sure that every standard we create works for every person. So yeah, um, that was my experience with theater. I wanted to also talk a little bit about voiceover. Um, I'm a voice actor, and so something that voiceover allows us to do is play characters that don't align with our gender because it's only the voice, because the voice can sound like a lot of things. The voice isn't a gendered instrument, and oftentimes I'll find myself playing little boys, for instance. Uh, you'll find many people with treble voice types like my own are usually the type of people playing younger boy characters who are pre-puberty. And so voiceover gets into an interesting question about casting. Uh, and you'll notice this in communities of color as well. There is a huge issue in the world of voiceover and casting about accuracy and casting representation truthfully so that people are telling their own stories and not taking advantage of the fact that this medium allows you to play someone you're not to try and tell a story that isn't yours to tell. So for instance, when casting roles uh, in the world of voiceover, there's a lot of talk about like, okay, well, how do I make sure it's clear that this character needs to sound male or sound female, that they're a male or female character, but that it's okay for trans people to audition, even if their voice uh, sounds like something other than their gender identity. And so there's a little bit of misalignment there. For instance, um, if you didn't know, uh, trans feminine folks who go on HRT, that stands for hormone replacement therapy. So they do not experience any type of voice reversal if they have gone through a testosterone based puberty. So trans feminine folks who went through age 12, 16, not presenting as female at that time and had that testosterone puberty experience, their voice will drop and that change does not go back. So you'll find that there are many trans feminine people who don't have what is considered a traditionally feminine voice type. But we still want to have trans feminine voice actors. So how do we make sure that our casting calls let them know what roles they are welcomed and wanted in, even the ones outside of their own specific identity? Because a trans feminine voice actor might not want to audition for only roles labeled as trans feminine roles. It's really limiting as an actor to be told you can only play characters within your trans type. There's a lot of binary trans people, especially who really have an interest in being cast in cisgender roles of their gender. So for instance, a transgender man might be really interested in being cast as a cisgender man, being cast as someone who was assigned male at birth and did not need to transition to be perceived as male, because that's really affirming to just be seen as a guy with no strings attached. It can be really affirming for trans people to have situations where it's not a big deal that you're trans. Um, we don't feel normal a lot of the times, especially in the day and age that we live in right now. There's a lot of otherness that exists, uh, feeling othered. And so giving trans people the opportunity to play cisgender characters of their identity can be really exciting. For non-binary people like myself, so for instance, I said little boys are a role that I, I tend to voice. And I also do little girls. 
I do both. And I do non-binary characters. And for me, being able to access the full spectrum is what affirms me. And if I'm ever asked to audition for older male characters where I'm like, I think my voice is a bit of a stretch for this, it's affirming to be asked to audition and to be told that I have a place at this table and am being considered. I know that it can be tricky when we're like, but I really want this specific sound. And I want to say it in a way that it's clear that this character needs to sound masculine and have a certain voice type, but you don't need to identify as a man to voice it. I'm trying to figure out all this language stuff, right? It's really messy. There are a couple different ways that I found that have worked really well. One is to give the characters pronouns. So rather than say you're looking for feminine actors, masculine sounding actors, androgynous voice, androgynous voice is a useless term and I recommend not using it because what does that even mean? The voice isn't a gendered instrument. We created the idea that there are feminine and masculine sounds. So I recommend using pronouns or gender descriptor for what the character identifies as, and then let us know if you're open to actors of all genders and ethnicities or abilities, you know, making sure there's a statement that says, here are the groups that this is open to. Sometimes you'll have a role that is a canonically trans role, and you'll want a similar note that says, this role is open only to trans actors. So this gets into kind of the other side of the table because it's so easy to cast people in roles that they are not. In the trans community, we've dealt with a little bit of an issue of having cisgender actors being cast in trans roles, such as voiceover roles. And the BIPOC community dealt with this as well, having white actors being cast in, in roles of color because it was voiceover and you can get away with it if you're not on screen. It's really, really important for me personally to cast accurately. This is an opinion section. And truthfully, I can't make anyone and wouldn't try to change anyone's belief system. But I know for me, as an actor in this industry, performer, creative, human trying to survive, that I think casting representationally is the most empowering thing we can do right now. I think there's sometimes a little bit of but acting is acting. So like, shouldn't you be able to play any character because pretending is the whole point? And people try to use that argument, but I would say my counter argument is why do you think that this person who doesn't belong to the identity group can tell this story better than somebody who does? And if you think that, question that. That's me, that's my two cents. Opinion disclaimer, absolutely. But I found it really, really empowering and exciting to get people of those minorities into those roles, because then you end up with a really beautiful, diverse, collaborative network, and you're actually getting those, those groups of people airtime. You're uplifting those communities. Right now, we're kind of fighting an uphill battle with stories where we need these stories to be told, right? Right. We're in, a, we're in an era where we really need more information, more stories about historically underrepresented groups out there and made. But if we're making it without those voices in the room, we risk spreading misinformation. We risk sending the wrong idea about what this identity actually is and what it means to be, you know, and how we actually protect those people and we're also by making this work and casting accurately you start to allow more actors to be visible more underrepresented performers and creatives start getting in the spotlight and as we uplift those voices we're creating we're changing the landscape of artistry overall so that it's not so hard to find really well told well produced well funded stories about these amazingly diverse populations that exist within humanity. Humanity is so gloriously diverse. And I think that at the end of the day, gender is just one more piece of the puzzle of trying to show all of the things that people can be. We can be so much more than the boxes we've been trying to put ourselves in for a very long time. So that's voiceover and a little bit of casting and hiring. I know that some people struggle to find diversity. There's sometimes the question of like, well, it's so hard to find people of this group. 
where are they? Why can't I find them? And the answer why is because of historically being disadvantaged. A lot of the times it's harder to find people of minority populations, not just because there's perceived less of them, but rather because when you've historically been put into this smaller place and not given access to the resources you need to get training, to get publicity, to be seen in the public eye, to be given funding, it's much harder for people of minority groups, such as trans and non-binary people, to access resources because the nature of our culture, of our identity, means that more people are putting barriers to access. So you might find it's difficult to find a Black trans woman of color for your project because it was really hard for a Black trans woman of color to get college degree in acting. It was hard for her to afford acting classes. Maybe she couldn't find a space that was safe for her to exist as her authentic self and train. It could be money. It could be safety. It could be I can't access a car because of my financial disadvantage. And that means I can't get to the spaces I need to get to to reach the level of artistry or the or the circle of people, the network that I'm trying to get into. So these people exist. The artists of these diverse populations are out there and hungry to make art. Even if you feel like you're struggling to find someone from a population, they are out there. It just means that they've been historically disadvantaged to a point where it's going to be more work to find them because the universe didn't give them what they needed to be right here with us, the people who had access to enough privilege to get to this place already, right? So if you find yourself struggling to identify um, a collaborator that you need, maybe you're looking to cast someone in a particular part that is gendered, maybe you're looking for a consultant, maybe you're just like, I don't have any trans people on my team and I'd like to have a diverse team while I'm trying to make this project. If you're just looking to diversify your network, I highly, highly recommend the internet. It's an amazing tool. Uh, there are so many organizations that have created databases that are creating public forums or places where you can say, I'm looking for this person. How do I get in connect with trans feminine actors of color, trans masculine actors from the from from this area of uh, actors who are trans and have disabilities, you know, finding intersectional identities can be challenging. But if you start looking, there are a lot of spaces that have been created and just haven't been given the publicity they need to thrive. And as soon as we find them, we want to uplift those places and start giving them that publicity as well. I think a lot of trans inclusivity is knowing that the work is long and that every project while you want to do things in the moment and with your project to take care of any individuals who are from certain populations who have certain needs, even though you want to be doing those things in the moment, this is also the long game of creating overall structures that are more accessible and more compassionate towards people of diverse identities and uplifting those voices to play the long game so that they can join us in this overall shifting of culture towards more visibility, more normalizing of standards and structures that are inclusive. I'm checking on time. I have like 10 more minutes to blabber on, it looks like. So I'll keep blab away, blab ahead. Away. Uh, writing trans characters. So if we have writers who are tuning in, Writing a story about a trans person is so exciting. I would love to see more trans stories that are about trans people who are doing not trans things. Something that would make a huge difference to many populations is to see their identities on screen, on stage, in on paper, wherever content is existing. We want to see ourselves outside of this idea that we exist within a cultural trauma box. Every trans story is not a trans trauma story. I tell a lot of trans trauma stories in my personal work, but that's because I'm speaking from places of personal experience and interacting with my community and creating those teams so that those stories are told accurately and in a way that is impactful and helps our cause. If you are someone who is not transgender, I don't advise personally trying to tell a story about trans trauma. And the same goes for other marginalized groups, 
people of color, folks with disabilities. You don't want to try and tell a story about what it's like to suffer as a particular type of person if you're not that person, because people who are those people are going to tell that story the best. But I highly, highly encourage you to just start writing more diverse characters with no reason for them being trans other than we exist. Trans people exist normally. There are trans people working at your grocery store, at your bank, who are driving your Uber or your Lyft. You know, trans people are the same as cisgender people when it comes to what it looks like to just try and live as a human in the society. We are just trying to be human right alongside you. And we'd love to be seen in those same normal human roles. So if you were thinking about casting a cisgender person as your bank teller, consider having a statement that says, hey, we are looking for diverse identities for this role because it's exciting to just be a normal trans person. It's hard to describe. Um, I was in this film, The Magical Christmas Tree. I was cast... It was almost a direct offer. I was invited to audition. They found me through a database because they were looking for non-binary actors for this role about this. This film is, as far as I know, the only Christmas rom-com that is a non-binary T for T story. So this is The Magical Christmas Tree available on Amazon Prime and Tubi, should you be interested. Uh, and what was really fun about the role I was invited to play is I was asked to be an accountant. My character, Pace Howard, is a non-binary accountant. And the story itself, The Magical Christmas Tree, it mentions non-binariness. There's a scene where we touch on it and what it's like to, to feel not quite understood. And that's it. That's not the plot of the movie at all. My character is a non-binary accountant who meets a non-binary elf in the woods and falls in love. And it's beautiful. And that's what one example of a non-trauma trans story can look like because it's empowering to just put us in these silly roles that any other person could have been put in. I also recommend giving your trans characters more personality traits than just being trans. Um, <laughs> crazy thought, I know, but it's it's definitely important, you know, to make sure you're thinking about how diverse our world is and how any story you're trying to tell, it's very powerful and important to reflect the diversity and nuance of our world. But also we don't wanna be doing the kind of diversity lip service, the, um, oh, I am blanking on the word when you're tokenized. Uh, we do not wanna tokenize people, right? And so to avoid basically fishing for trans people or people or other minorities because you're just trying to have a diverse project, think about them as full humans, crazy idea, uh, and give them more personality traits than just being trans. We are humans, just like cisgender folks, and we would love to be treated with that like same, you're writing a character, and this is just one thing on the bullet list of things that's a part of their life story. Really well-rounded characters are something that I still hunger to see more of. I still feel like a lot of the trans narratives that I've had the opportunity to interact with have been rooted in trauma or in the like, this character is trans for a reason. And I've only just reached the point in the past maybe two or three years where I have a lot of collaborators who really understand how important it is to just write trans characters with no strings attached. And so now I have people who are like, hey, I'm going to write this character and I'm thinking about giving them Zezer pronouns. Would you be interested in reading for them? And just like starting to normalize trans characters appearing alongside their cis characters. I love that the director of the Magical Christmas Tree, Scott, he actually just invited me um, to do another role with him because he had a new film he was making. And this character was also non-binary. I got to wear my shirt open post-top surgery. That's really affirming for me. Opportunities for me. That's again, a, like a, me specifically, I don't speak for all trans people, but I know for me, it's so euphoric and exciting to be told I can have my shirt off uh, around in public because I didn't used to be able to do that. And now that I can, it's so exciting to just be like, 
look at this. <laughs> I'm a professional and I'm getting paid to do this. I love the opportunity to just be authentically myself. I make jokes about my transness all the time. I think gender is so funny and that if we got less uptight about it, it would create such joyful spaces to just make jokes about the silly nature of, yeah, we made these two little boxes that everyone should fit inside and this system was definitely going to work. Yeah. So I got to play this role on this this recent shoot by the same director. And I what I love about his work is that he likes to cast outside of type something we run into the in the industry a lot is oh well your type is this character and for trans people that can be so hard because our types often don't line up with what we'd like to be doing because our body tells one story our face the way that we look tells one story according to a casting team and we're like but but that's that's just how I look and I'd like to be able to tell these stories because they resonate with my identity. Scott, the director of this film, is someone who casts outside of type. And so he cast me as this uh, stoner-esque character, someone who's extremely chill. I wore flip-flops, no socks. When does that ever happen? Uh, and was just a chill stoner person who was post-op wearing their shirt open the whole, the whole film. Like my pronouns are not even mentioned. I don't introduce myself with my pronouns at all. I just exist. And that was really affirming for me. So just thinking about ways that affirming trans people, and I've used that word a lot. I'll define it real quick. Affirming is a term that I'm using to describe when you, when something helps a trans person or any person with gender to feel euphoria, to feel, oh, that is affirming my gender experience and saying, yes, I see you as the gender that you are. And that it's something that cis people do experience, but don't notice as much because it's normal. For trans people, the difference for our gender euphoria is that it was a lot more work for us to obtain for in a lot of sy systems, uh, situations, doing a lot of generalizing. And there are cis people who might feel dysphoria as well. For instance, um, if cis women, for instance, struggling with PCOS, which is a condition that can sometimes cause excessive body hair, amongst other things. A cis woman with excessive body hair could feel dysphoria because that's not how she associates her femininity being expressed. And so the opposite side of dysphoria is euphoria and affirming that euphoria. And that's what we want in trans spaces is to basically make it so that a trans or non-binary person can feel as at ease in their expression and their body and their existence as any other human in the room. And I've walked right on up to my 40 minute time. So would we like to do Q and A? Absolutely. Well done you. <laughs> okay, right on up there. Um, Laura, did you have something before I start diving in? Uh, no, I mean, there's so much to process here. You know, I found myself thinking about casting decisions we've made in our productions at school and the efforts that we've made to be inclusive. Um, we just did, in, for example, um, in the fall, we did Into the Woods and cast um, an openly trans male student as Jack um, without hesitation. And he was incredible. Um, and the same student got cast in a male role um, in our town in the spring, you know, and earned it outright. There was never a question in the room when the first audition happened, we all looked at each other and we like, God, that would, that, that, that's exactly who should be playing that part, you know? And so we've been making a lot of, um, I mean, it makes me tear up thinking about it because watching the student who, you know, whose dead name was female and whose identity was female when they started with us in middle school in seventh grade, um, move into themselves more fully. And then us being able to cast them so completely without reservation, you know, and to, to, you know, to not have them walk in the room and go, Ooh, what are we going to do here? It's like, come in and show us what you got you know, and never, and not a person in the room on the directing team hesitated. We're like, well, there's Jack, you know, that's done. Now let's move on to some other things, you know? Um, and so watching that start to evolve in our student body, 
um, has been really um, empowering for students, but also really informative for us, you know, in terms of, of casting. Like you said, I was thinking as you were talking, like you see Laverne Cox cast as the florist and a, and a, and a shop owner in, in you and the identity wasn't the main, wasn't what the character revolved around. You know, and and you, you know, I, I, you know, I went to see Little Shop of Horrors a few years ago with MJ Rodriguez playing Audrey, and it's like, and she was amazing, you know, and just the just the, see and, tra and transparent the musical is down at the music center right now, and I'm thinking, you know, it's not just that you're seeing these stories told, you're seeing characters being cast in places where they should be, and so I'm listening to you and like taking notes on like things to bear in mind, like as we're as we're picking shows, as we're casting, you know, cause like we're talking about doing guys and dolls this year. And it's like, well, of course some of the women could play gangsters, um, you know, but what if it's just, you know, I mean, anybody could be a gangster. It doesn't always have to be, you know, you don't, we don't have to, we don't have to kind of gender, you know, assign gender identity to certain characters, even if it's called guys and dolls, there's a lot of fluidity there, you know, and there's a lot of fluidity in shows that people don't normally think there is. It, it, it's until how you bring yourself to crafting it and, and what you what you leave open when kids come in the room and show you who they are you know so it's I'm just I'm getting excited listening to you and feeling like some of what you're saying really affirms work we've been trying to, to do and then some things you're saying I'm thinking we need to do better in those areas and we need to we need to think about what that looks like especially for vulnerable teenagers who are willing to tell you who they are at an age where I like most of us were not as self-realized as teenagers as teenagers are today. And the fact that they feel safe enough to tell you who they are, you know, we give questionnaires at the start of the year and let them tell us what their pronouns are and what name they want to go by. And can we call them that name? Is that okay? You know, and it's because I teach the arts, I'm really sensitive to that, you know, and, and, and making sure that you tell me how you want, need to be in my space and what I can do to support you. Um, and we, we as a faculty have committed ourselves to trying to create those spaces but it happens in varying degrees, depending on someone's um, personal identity and comfort. So I'm just, I'm taking rapid fire. while well, I'm looking down because I'm taking notes on what you're saying, kind of the, you know, the, the, the key things that we need to keep in mind as we're working with young people who are, uh, you know, really trying to come into their truth and, and figure out how to create spaces for them to be known and seen and to not assume that we know what roles they want to be considered for. You know, I think that's, and, and and I have friends that work in the voiceover industry too. And she, my, one of my girlfriends does play some male characters, you know, and it, it, it's so much of what you're saying is resonating, but is, is reminding me of things we need to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. so. And with a show like Guys and Dolls, I, we're working against an aging canon that is not 100%. the world we're in today, right? And yeah. so we look at some of the older material would a show like Guys and Dolls be adaptable for a non-binary person? Right. Non-binary person be comfortable in a show called Guys and Dolls. Right. Like the older canon, I think there's something especially and it's And it's about... also so like male heavy. It's a, you know, it was a, it's a patriarchal art form for a long time. And so there's so many things from certain eras that, mm -hmm. that yeah, I mean, they're a reflection of the era in which they were created and of the people who created them. And, and what they were creating space for. But yeah, like that's one of the things we've talked about is like, do we even do a show like that? Or, you know, can you can you do Grease and not acknowledge that like what Sandy chooses to do at the end of the show is something that our teenage girls are all standing up and saying they don't want to do in their lives, you know? Like, do can you still do Grease and have a moral compass that points in the direction that 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 kids can line up with? And so we've been kind of eliminating certain things for reasons because they're not holding up the way they used to. Yeah. And so this reminds me if 1776 rings bells for anybody, that is yeah, yeah. an older musical that recently was, it's been touring North America, right. it was on Broadway. And currently there is a, a revival production with an all women and non-binary cast of a show that has almost entirely male roles. My daughter just, my, she saw it recently. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I saw the show as well. And what I found really interesting about the way the source material was transformed by the casting is that so much of it was rooted in misogyny and patriarchy. A lot of the humor used to draw on degrading women. And then when we put only women and non-binary people in these roles, saying these jokes in an almost like, yeah, it's so funny that we used to write this as authentically funny, huh? 
and they kind of parody it by the nature of the casting there has been a bit of a rise in gender expansive gender blind there's a couple of different terms circulating but basically casting where you write what the roles what the gender of the role is but you open it to anyone of any identity and don't think about anyone's gender when casting but rather right. just think about your total roles i've seen some really fun gender inclusive casts uh, i saw assassins which is a stephen Ooh. sondheim musical i'm yeah. going to a new brain which is like this fun little lesser known musical that's normally about this cisgender man experiencing a, a medical trauma and instead there's going to be a non-binary person playing the the main lead cisgender male role and mm. actually this non-binary person had reached out to me asking if I had any availability to be their understudy because they really wanted to make sure that a cisgender man wasn't the one understudying them because they wanted to preserve the fact mm. that there was a change in meaning through the casting and they didn't want to lose that if yeah. an understudy of a different identity was to tell the story. I have a question for you. Um, one of the things that we bumped up against in some of our recent production meetings is when you cast against the type you know a, a role the way it's written in a musical like in a play you're not having to deal with vocal registers and singing you know and so when you're dealing with musicals um you know if you cast somebody in a role whose voice like you were saying doesn't rest in the place where the song is written but they have to sing with someone wh whose voice does rest there you know there's a lot of things to consider when you're doing musicals versus plays and so one of the things we bump up a uh, bump up against is you know it's not, it's not so much would we cast this person because they could do it. It's like, how do we need to then transpose or modify or, or manipulate the music to make sure it still works? Yeah, that is an excellent question. And it's actually one that as a musical theater writer, interacting with a whole generation of musical theater writers, more and more people are starting to consider. I know that other transgender musical theater writers like myself are thinking about having starting to offer like transposed versions of our songs as part of our whole package, like have different keys so that people are able to access the material regardless of voice type. That's not like you should call, you should have a whole like canon of, of like, just call it transpose, you know? And like, there's your whole, like, oh, you're, you're like with the, with the, with the sensitivity to the, like what the music calls for or what the music allows somebody to be able to, how they bring themselves to it. Yeah, you know, something about that that's, that's a really important component when you're with when you're dealing with music. Yeah, obviously, it's a complex question that is going to be a very different answer depending on your material. But in yeah. just like a general blanket kind of answer way, um, we have a lot of transpositional tools in this modern day and age. There's actually like a browser extension you can download right. that will allow you to transpose yep. anything you're listening to if you're doing karaoke track off of right. YouTube. So with all these tools available to us as leaders in artistic spaces, if you feel like competent enough with those tools, giving your students that option could be really empowering right. so that they know that that's not a barrier to them accessing a space right. and that they can be accommodated if that's a and need. That's what, that's what we typically do is uh, take advantage of those resources. And our um, our music director is, is incredibly gifted and is amazing at transposing um, I mean, he transposes a lot of stuff on the spot when kids come in and he said, let's just take it down a third and he'll, he can, so he's a rock star in that sense because he can do a lot of it for us, but then we also can run it through some of our music, you know, the, the, the tools and resources. Um, it, it, and it's easier to do if it's a soloist than when you've got multiple part harmonies and things like that. So it's just something that we've been talking about as we're kind of thinking about, you know, you know, the if then of casting, you yeah. know. Um, and, and, and if this person has this role, then what happens musically or, or, you know, where does, where does the rest of the cast fall out? But it's just, there's so much to consider and trying to create space and opportunities for performers who have every right to be on stage. Yeah, it's really great that you already have that knowledge. You might be aware that for some some folks who are transgender, singing in certain parts of their register can be dysphoric. So the fact that you're also having this conversation is going to help protect them so yeah. much by letting them know they don't have to sing any higher or lower than yeah. feels emotionally safe and comfy and okay. healthy for them. I'm also thinking about octave displacement. Yeah. I 
recently, recently, a year ago, I saw a little night music with two trans actors in traditionally binary cisgender roles. Um, I saw a trans feminine person play the lead love interest and Eggerman, and I saw a trans masculine non-binary person in the uh, the character that is the love interest of the, the like a fair love interest of that character. So basically creating a trans for trans, also known as T for T relationship of a non-binary person and trans feminine person. And otherwise it was just a normal Stephen Sondheim, a little bit older canon musical, but with these characters and the trans feminine actor, Elle Duran, um, she's amazing. You can find them on Instagram. They did a little bit of octave displacement, like at certain points in the phrase, I knew the music well enough to notice when they went down instead of up because in one yep. note or a part of the phrase would have been a little too high. And yeah. just that little adjustment, yeah, because they were a strong enough vocalist that they still made it sound like a complete yeah. phrase. It was not an issue at all to have it octave displaced. Well, and with, with young voices that are changing, one of the things you're dealing with is teenagers whose voices are changing anyway. So what, you know, a lot of times what we're trying to do is figure out where does this sit best in your voice? So that's something that we deal with all the time, regardless of how students identify, but you, I find that we're trying to be more mindful of it with with students who might have more sensitivity around what they want their voice to be able to do and what it can actually do at this point in their life or in their development or in their transition or wherever they're at um and that's that's a that's an added layer with a musical that's different from a play um <sighs> I'm just, so, I'm so, so much to think about kids specifically um and working with with youth in this like gender inclusive and mindful way being able to give young people that experience, I'm just so excited. That wasn't something that I had. And I'm so excited for you to be making that space. It's I'm thinking lovely. about exploration and about just the the value of giving, not even a kid who said that they think they might be trans or non-binary, but just all kids, giving them that space to explore and dismantle the idea that there are rules that will have to be followed for their entire life about how they're allowed to express themselves. Yeah. Theater is such an important place for that exploration, an amazing, liberating place. Um, I, I know we've been talking a lot about like formal projects and rehearsals where everything is kind of scripted from top to start. Um, but I'm also thinking about like acting classes and when you're trying to teach the craft and about how you can assign roles in a gender blind or gender neutral way when you're reading scenes for practice, when you're just like going through something at a table read and you need someone to tap in, you know, being mindful about mindful might not even be the right word thinking about how the gender binary is a system while while binary genders of woman and man absolutely are real and exist the problem that has been creating really difficult situations for trans and non-binary people is that we've been operating on the assumption they were the only things that existed and so if you make the mental update do the software update essentially of oh all of the boxes are open and on the floor and we can crawl into any of them. Uh, <laughs> there is no box. I don't know. There's a better box metaphor here, I'm sure. But basically the idea of adjusting your mindset regarding binary gender, this is such a broad topic and truly it's like its own talk about how to adjust the way that you look at gender in the world. A lot of it is practice. And so I'm so glad to hear that you've already begun that process because the more you continue on this path, the more you will learn. Yeah. A lot of this subject will be on the ground learning. You know, something that is really, this is kind of like a little trans culture inside joke thing. I watch television and film with my partner a lot. My partner is also a trans person. She's a trans woman. And we like to try and guess which characters are going to come out as trans in two years. We like to watch TV and say that character is going to go by she, they in two years. That character is going to be a they, he in two years. And there's something that we found joy in as trans people of noticing all the ways in which many people who are comfortable describing themselves as cisgender, we see through that and we see the possibilities. We see the potential of gender. We see through the gender veil. 
And so that's like the long game of this work of being able to see through the gender veil and be able to see the possibilities. It yeah. is a skill but you're already doing the work. And I'm so excited for as yeah. you continue to open the liberating spaces you're going to make for these kids. Oh, thanks. I, you know, I, I just, you've, there's, you've given me a lot to think about. It makes me, you know, I kind of want to follow up with you and see if you can come do some kind of presentation with, That's with us of some sort, you know, how cool talk, is that? Talk Jeez. about, talk about that with our faculty, but maybe with some of our students as well. Yes. Oh my gosh. I would love to speak to trans youth. Right. We have, I mean, and part of what's fascinating to me working with the GSA club too, um, is the, the number of middle schoolers who are openly identifying as trans now. And I'm thinking like middle school is hard enough as it is, but to be that aware of yourself at, you know, at 12, yeah. um, you know, and to have parents who, who for, for in large part are supporting them, even if they don't understand it all they love their kids and they're trying to you know help them navigate um it, it's it's fascinating to me because I grew up in an era where that was not even close to something you could have done and felt safe at school you know yeah. especially to when I went to a public school but still yeah but I was thinking too like we binge watched the kids and we'd all watched Heartstopper and love it and we, they decided they wanted to do a binge watch marathon with the GSA club and just watch it stem to stern you know and there's some great wow. characters there too that just are who they are and it's you know and and that was something that was I thought really affirming as well um and I it was refreshing to see characters that were written that way in the first place yeah. Oh, I don't know if this is something, if you do any type of awards within your school or something, but something I, I didn't touch on is actually like the Tonys. I don't know if anyone's heard about the non-binary actors that have been nominated for Tonys in the past year or so mm -hmm. that have had to decline their nominations because they were told they would have to pick a binary gender category and they wow. just, they would not do that. Really? Mm. Right now we are in a very pivotal moment where the gendered award system is now officially preventing non-binary people from receiving recognition for their achievements. My hope is that in the future, we'll be dismantling it and we'll find another way to uplift the top of our class without saying that this is the category that we should separate people by. I would love to come up with a better system, but thinking about the context of kids and about how there are certain gendered ideas, it might be a gendered award like best actor, best actress, or it might be another type of gender role that is available to succeed in that we can dismantle the gendered nature of those roles. Yeah. Gender neutral by any space, truly. That would be fascinating and really good. Wow, yeah. I, hadn't really, uh, I hadn't heard about that. That and that kind of breaks your heart that somebody would be deserving of recognition, and then you know the, that the awarding body doesn't know how to how to recognize them, or that they feel that they have to decline it because it it doesn't speak to who they are. Yeah. yeah. So my hope is that we're in a moment where the push for change will get us over that hill and get us to those new systems. But that's what we're up against right now. We're working against a historically boxed up system. And the the actor I'm thinking of, Justin Sullivan from Anne Juliet, who declined the nomination, is stellar and is receiving so much love right now from the audiences. And yeah, it is heartbreaking that they can't receive a Tony because the system isn't allowing them to be labeled properly, to be addressed properly. Yeah. Yeah. Like Mr. Best supporting, per or best supporting performer. Yeah. Something mm -hmm. that doesn't have a gendered uh, attachment to it. And like there are certain, um, certain systems, I'll use the word again, like honorifics, for example, Mr., Ms., and Mrs. Mm -hmm. uh, if we think about places where it's normalized to divide up by gender, so we've been talking about like the basic theatrical casting and stuff like that in your dance numbers, breaking people up by men and women and all those things, but there's also many other places that we've gotten used to automatically putting that gender label on as we move into that space something as simple as putting on stationary Mr. or Mrs. Thinking, starting to question these places where we've gotten into the habit of calling out people's gender and thinking about where is that necessary and where can it be modified to allow for people with expansive gender experiences? Mm. Yeah. yeah. 
There's so much of a tie over. I mean, I've been looking that with um, disability inclusion, because so it's it's enormous. One of the things though, that I was talking about with one of the artists from Opulent Mobility was um, they were doing something on inclusiveness and trying to do that inclusiveness of all kinds in academic spaces. Mm -hmm. And some people were getting really, really upset about the, oh, well, I should just allow them to bring in a teddy bear. The artist is saying, yeah. Yeah. In what way does it harm you? Right. For this person, people know what they need in order to make things work for them. They know what they need. And ask them and they will tell you. And you may not appreciate it. You may not understand it. You may not enjoy it. But if it's not harming the rest of the group, why not? Yeah. Let the person bring in a teddy bear and a blanket if they need it. You know, let them use the, the, the pronouns they need, be who they are. Right. I love that example. That's such a great example because a teddy bear and a blanket, is they're so harmless, right? Mm -hmm. And there's so many things that we individuals, we identify what tools best help us operate in our daily life. And like, if for a trans man, that's wearing a packer. So packer is a term we use to describe either a model of a phallic object or basically something to substitute it that is worn in the crotch area to create a bulge so that that person feels perceived as masculine. Yeah. But I was thinking about your comment about the binder because Max, who was playing our Jack, mm -hmm. wears a binder all the time and, and is very, and, and people know, and is very open about like, you know, here's what I need and, you know, and is... Yeah feels safe and surrounded by people who know him well enough that that we took that into consideration but not everyone is going to be as forthcoming about that something you know? that uh my friends started doing back when I was binding I bound like every day for two three years straight you know mm -hmm. and I that, that was my life for a long time and something my friends started doing that really made me feel seen and taken care of was hey how long have you been wearing your binder do you need to take a break yeah. Just being aware that that was something I was wearing and that in the same way that a person who's a spoonie, who's a chronically ill person might need a break for yeah. some reason to be like, hey, do you need to sit down? Do you need yeah. a glass of water? You're someone with low blood sugar. Do you need me to right. grab you a snack? You know, all of these right. things being being mindful about the possibility of the need and being the one to initiate the request yeah. of like, do you need this? That applies across the board in life for like all situations. Yeah. But in this yeah. trans context, that alone, that's beyond allyship. That's then like, not just I'm trying to make sure that, that I'm doing the right stuff, but like, I see you and I see your needs and I'm gonna make sure you're taken care of. So important, yeah. Mm -hmm. It is what we all need, right? <laughs> well, it just reminds you not to make assumptions, you know, to let the, to let people tell you who they are and what they need. And then when they do that, you have to believe them and figure out how to, how to make that happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And do that within the best of our abilities, because that's what we can do. Right. You know? Well, I think also what happens with a lot of, I think with a lot of at least a lot of adults who uh, and older adults who are working in a in a, an environment and around student you know people who are a different generation from them and and go you know and the language and then the, so there's so much that moves at a faster speed than they can keep up with or that we can keep up with is is understand that you're going to make mistakes and that's going to be okay as long as you learn from them and you and you figure out how to do better you know i think a lot of people are so afraid of saying or doing the wrong thing that they they either say or do nothing or they fall back on the thing that they've always done and and end up sometimes doing more harm as a result you know and so I think that being able to to kind of understand that you're going to stumble uh, you yeah know. don't be afraid of being wrong because I know that that there are parts of the community that have gotten very angry because things are bad and we're angry because it should be over. We've yeah. said everything that needs to get fixed and it should be fixed by now. There are a lot of people who are angry, but I feel that the majority of trans people would be so excited to receive the type of welcoming that we're talking about. And yeah. you can make those mistakes if you've made it clear that any feedback you receive is going to be taken yeah. and implemented. You know, there's a difference between someone, I've had a lot of people get a little mad at me for correcting them when they got my pronouns wrong. 
And that's something I have to do every day. I correct people on this every day. Every time I step outside my door, I'm probably going to have to correct them on this. And I've been working on, instead of saying, I'm sorry, just saying, thank you. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you for, thank you for telling me. Thank you for reminding me and not apologizing and making them feel the need to forgive or to like, you know, justify that they called you out on it. Like, just thank you for that. You know, you made a mistake that people make at me every day. But if you take the correction, when I say they, and you go, thank you, they, and you implement it, I feel so much safer than when I'm at the doctor's office or the bank or the pharmacy or all of those places where I repeatedly have to decide whether to correct or to just suffer in silence, which Mm -hmm. is something that especially as a non-binary person. So binary trans people will have this experience less because there's more of a clear like binary people will start assuming their pronouns correctly if they reach a certain point in their transition socially and physically where they pass. That's a term that we use to describe being perceived as the thing that you are correctly by a stranger, passing as a woman if you're trans feminine uh, or passing as a man if you're trans masculine. But for non-binary people, there is no passing because the world at large does not remember that there's more options than she and he and that's also something you can think about if you haven't already is defaulting to they for people who haven't introduced themselves to you yet starting to get used to rather than doing the he or she I see that still in contracts in emails and places and it's so it it's not even as as effective and efficient as they you know they as a singer singular neutral pronoun is a powerful tool and is really, really great for us to start using every day before someone has told us what their pronouns are so that then we make the switch to what they've let us know is what they use and feels good for them. And conversely, if someone tells you their pronouns are not they, them, making sure we don't use they, them for those people. So if a trans woman says my pronouns are she, her, Make sure that you're not accidentally starting to slip back into that they, them default for her because trans femmes get they, themed a lot because people aren't willing to address them as women. We've covered a lot of ground. We have, but this is wonderful. I'm just, I'm trying to keep the recordings down to an hour. So yeah, let's (laughs) wrap on up. I think we talked about a lot of amazing things. Thank you so much. This was, I feel like I got like this special treatment because it was just the three of us. It's so enlightening and helpful and people watching the recording, you know, you really missed out. This was a pretty amazing space to be in. It's a great space. And I will say, um, you can get the recording, get in touch and we can send it to you.